Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron here. I hope you're having a great day in Jesus. We're in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, 32. Yep, Martin Luther thought Romans 8 is a high point of scripture. You know, I think it's all equally inspired. And it is just fantastic, this Romans 8 we're in, though, because it's telling us how to walk the spirit-filled life, the results of the new birth. And that is one of the tragedies of the apostolic movement, is I don't think it, uh, enough people really realize how awesome the new birth is, the power in the new birth, the power in the gospel. So let's look at verse 32. You know, we've already seen verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? The answer is nobody. Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Now for us, that's two big words. I know they might be small, but they're massive. You go through a whole study in the New Testament about everything God did for us. So Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is bringing out what God's trying to communicate is that if God loved us so much, then the term son is God in flesh, God in his humanity, that he would give of himself, give of himself in his humanity, then what else will not God do for us, you know? So he that spared not his own son, the man Christ Jesus, but delivered him up for us all. Now that's a good, you know, there's a doctrine out there. Presbyterians believe this, Calvinists believe this, and it's called limited atonement. At least most of them, it's traditional Calvinism. Tulip, you know, total depravity and uh, unmerited favor or whatever, limited atonement, irresistible grace and uh, perseverance of the saints. And so that's Tulip acronym. And, but he died for us all. Now they would say, well, that's written to the church, but he did die for all. Okay. Delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Grace of God gives us all things. And he gives us all things. We've already read this in Romans that pertain to life and godliness. That's actually in first and second Peter. But as far as we shall reign in life by him, that's Romans chapter five. So he freely, that's his grace, gives us all things. Well, what did he give us? He gave us a new birth. He gave us freedom from sin. He gives us uh, power, all things are working together for our good. He gives us the gifts of the Spirit. He gives us love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such shares in the law. He gives us uh, healing for our bodies. He gives us victory in our souls and our spirits. He gives us joy unspeakable, full of glory. He gives us an eternity with Him, with no sickness, no heartache, no pain. The former things passed away. He gives us the ability to be dead to sin, alive to God, live in joy, peace, and happiness. Now, yes, He. He has truly given us all things and he gives us you know the world to come we're going to be kings and priests with him of the increase of his government there shall be no end and we're in the body of christ we sit with him on the throne read ephesians 2 read uh Revelation 3.21. It's just in Scripture. So he gives us freely, that's the grace of God, all things, which everybody can get. Get rid of your denominationalism and see that God gives us freely all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, those that have been saved, born again of water and spirit, who have applied the grace of God in their lives? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? The answer is nobody. It is God that justifies. Look, if God says you're right, it doesn't matter what Satan says, doesn't matter what your boss says, doesn't matter what your coworker says, doesn't matter what your family says, doesn't matter what your neighbor says. God says you're okay when you're born again of water and spirit, living a holy life. God says you're justified. So it doesn't matter what Satan says, doesn't matter what demons say, nothing. <laughs> They can't lay any charge against you. He's the accuser of the brethren, Satan. And so it's like Daniel, you know, they, well, he does this. And Daniel comes out on top, man. Three Hebrew children, doesn't matter, king. We made up our mind, whatever you want to do. We're not bowing. So nobody can lay anything to your elect because you're the elect of God because you've chosen to be born again of water and spirit. God chose you for knowledge. He knows who's going to be saved. He chose the plan of salvation, but you have to to choose it by your free will. So it is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? So who can condemn you? Verse 34, it is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and right hand of God. He's sitting at the throne of God. That just means he's in the power of God. The Jewish authorities understood this when he said, you're going to see the son of man coming at the right hand of power. 
high priest says he's claiming to be God. They knew it wasn't a literal right hand. Spirit hath not flesh and bone. Spirit doesn't have a literal right hand. You know, David said, I've set God at my right hand. It's this man, I've made God my power. There's no, you know, nefarious, you know, co-equal, co-eternal persons of the Godhead. Nothing like that. All right. So, it is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And so he's our mediator. The man Christ Jesus makes intercession. That goes back to 8, 26, and 27 that we talked about in our last lesson. So, Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So, notice it's who, and then it begins talking about events. What? So, it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody. The only person that can separate you, that can take you out of the hand of God, John 10, 28 and 29, no man can take you out of the Father's hand, my hand, I and my Father are one. So, the Father's hand is Jesus' hand. When Jesus touched somebody, it was the Father. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. You're the Father in Christ. All right. So, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is nobody. The only person that can is you. You can choose to turn your back. Every devil in hell, every government, everything else cannot make you quit living for God. If you don't make it, you have nobody to blame. We're living in a blame culture right now in the United States of America. I blame this. I blame my ancestors. I blame, I blame, I blame, I blame, I'm unhappy. The reason you're unhappy is because you're not right with Jesus Christ. So you're out of the flow of the Holy Ghost. You're out of the flow of the love of God. So you're intensely unhappy. No doubt about it. So the answer is not to deconstruct Jacques de Rita, the current society. That's not the answer. The answer is to live for Jesus Christ, to be born again of water and spirit. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No, only if you let it. Or distress. Die stress. Double stress. Is that going to separate? Of course not. We, when tribulation comes, you should run to God. It is our fallen sinful nature. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are taken into captivity because they have no knowledge. So, when you go through tribulation, you should run to Jesus. But what Satan in our flesh wants to do is blame Jesus. Why did you let me go through this? Why did I have to go through this? You could have stopped this. Stop. He's your answer. He's the yay. He's the amen you know, the glory of God by him. He is your answer. He is your need meter. He is not your problem. Unless you're not living for him and you don't want to, then it's going to be a big problem throughout all eternity. And, you know, he has no pleasure at the death of the wicked, but you chose it. So, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody, no who, and then the what. No tribulation, no distress, no persecution can separate you from the love of Christ. None. He won't allow more to come on you than that which you're able, 1 Corinthians 10. But with the temptation, he'll make a way of escape. Or famine, starving to death. I've been young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. But I've known of apostolics who starved to death in India. I just know that. So, but famine reigns on the just and unjust alike. Jeremiah was in the famine, you know, in Nebuchadnezzar's time in Jerusalem. So, and he got bad bread. Micaiah got bad bread. All right. So, famine is not going to separate you from the love of Christ. Nakedness, that's the lack of clothing. That's not the public undressing of America, immodesty. This is talking about when you don't have enough money to buy clothes. You know, like William Tyndale writing in when he was 500 days in Vilvord Castle. And he writes this letter and he says, please give me some, because uh, I'm freezing to death up here in Belgium. And it's a cold, dark, dank prison that the Catholics had him in. Um, can you send some needle and thread and this type thing? Nakedness or peril. You know, that's like being in, in shipwreck or a storm or something. Or a sword. This is outright persecution or war can't separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Everybody needs to come to Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate you. Lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Quoting from Isaiah. So it's written. Notice, as it is written, they still had Isaiah present tense. 
Dead Sea Scrolls Ascenic community, first century BC. I've been to the museum of the book there, the, the scroll museum. It's absolutely fascinating. So we're killed all the day long. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Promise of God. So, but you go through all that. Verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. You know, conquer, victory, Nike in the Greek. That's what Nike is. It's the Greek term for victory. We're more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. That'd be cool. But he always causes us to triumph. He always causes us to overcome. He, he gives us the triumph in him. Colossians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, I believe it is. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So you, you know, quit living so depressed, so down, so discouraged, so beat up, so covetous, so you didn't get to go on a vacation, so you didn't blah, blah. You're more than a conqueror through him. You're saved. That's the best thing. But the problem is, is most people aren't saved. Most people get a bill of goods by the devil and they think they're saved and they're not. They shook a preacher's hand, said John 3, 16, confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, sign the back of a chick track or something like that, think they're saved. They're not. You must be born again of water and spirit. So the, the depression you feel is because you're not really saved. And they teach classes at denominational churches what to do when you feel like you're not really saved. But I'm going to tell you, apostolics need to live like saved people. We're lights. We're salt. All right. So we're more than conquerors through him that loved us, who freely gave us all things. He gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness, as I already said. Okay, verse 38, for I am persuaded, and uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. Okay, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, anything he forgets. I love Paul when he just throws a grenade out there and says anything else shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Where's the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? To wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing our trespasses unto us. You know, and so, the, separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So where do you see God? You see it in the face of Jesus Christ. And so nothing can separate you. God loves you. If you're separated, it's because you turn your back on God, not because he turned your back, uh, his back on you. You know, uh, God loves you. God cares. God was talking to Cain, even though he wasn't in the garden anymore. He was talking to him. God cares and loves you. Nothing can separate. So we need a theology. We need to begin to walk in victory, anointing, and faith, and get everything God's got for us, and not in defeat feet and discouragement and down. Amen. So chapter nine, you know, most apostolic churches now is I'm so defeated. I'm so devastated. I'm so cut up. I'm, I'm broken. And so God just put me back together and we live from service to service like that. And we don't live in anointing and victory. All right. Chapter nine. And so chapters nine, 10 and 11 seem to be where most of what's called pre predestination in this type thing comes from. And we're going to look at that and we're going to see we've already went through some in Romans eight uh, verses twenty nine, thirty. 31 that the predestination is foreknowledge and the predestination is groups but not individuals because it's not God's will that any should perish but all should come to repentance and everlasting life showing us the will of God is almost never done in that relations people say why well, pray the will of God can be done anyhow no it's not you have to pray it into existence according to scripture Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Why would he tell you to pray that if the will of God was going to be done anyhow? Chapter 9, I say the truth in Christ, because he's in the body of Christ, born again of water and spirit. Christ speaks through him, 
inspiration of the Holy Ghost, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Notice he had a conscience. I was reading a commentary from a Pentecostal thing the other day, and it said conscious, conscience was a New Testament concept. No, it wasn't. Paul's, I mean, David's conscience smote him. There was a conscience, and it was because people are created body, soul, and spirit. So are you saying they weren't created body, soul, and spirit in the Old Testament? You know, your conscience, your communication, your intuition, the spirit, candle of the Lord, craziness, insanity, and modern biblical scholarship. I guess they're about the same thing. Okay, verse 2. So his conscience bears him witness in the Holy Ghost. In conscience in Romans, you go back to Romans chapter 1. All right, verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So Paul was raised a Hebrew, the Hebrews. He was raised in the straightest sect of his religion, the Pharisee, and he had a burden for the Jewish people. Now, these tr people that try to say, Paul preached to the uh, Gentiles, Peter preached to the Jews. All that meant was that was the anointing of their ministry. But you'll notice Paul still went to the synagogue first almost everywhere he went. And, but he was preaching to Gentiles as well, he, but he went to the synagogue. So this is crazy that there's three different plans of salvation, two different plans of salvation, that you need a DNA test to see if you're really a, a Israelite, that the blacks are really Israelites, that the American Indians are really Israelites, that the Mormons are really Israelites, that the, uh, the Jews in the Holy Land are not really Israelites. They're Ashkenazic. They're Khazarians and blah, de, blah, de, blah, and all this. It's one salvation for everybody. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. Cornelius got saved the same way the people on the day of Pentecost got saved. Samaritans got saved the same way as the disciples of John the Baptist got saved. They got saved the same way the Romans got saved, which got saved the same way the Corinthians got saved, which got saved the same way the churches in Galatia got saved. Didn't matter. All right. So, so he's like, I, I, I could wish myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen. So he said, if that would make them saved... I could wish myself accursed from Christ. And then he says, who are Israelites to whom pertain. So the Israelites got a lot of good stuff. Remember, he talked about what advantages the Israelites have. Uh, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. God speaking to them in written form. The oracles of God. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory, the glory of God, and the covenants and the giving of the law of Sinai and the service of God, the tabernacle service, and the promises. So, he's clearly talking about Israelites. They existed then. They still exist today. They're not all Khazarians, and they're not some goofy group that people are just trying to play because they feel dispossessed. They're not the Boers in South Africa and whoever else. They're not the Anglicans. They're not the British Israel. It's just Jews, our Jews. But when they're saved, then we're all in the church of the living God. You can't be anti-Semitic and be a Christian because your boss is a Jewish carpenter. God bless. We'll pick up there 9-4 next time, God willing. Talk with you later in Jesus.